Okay, so I'd like to talk to you today about total ecosystem services value and a methodology that I've developed that allows us to look at what nature is providing to our economy here in southwest Florida. And this work was supported by independent grants that I was able to obtain uh, from the Elizabeth Ordway Dunn Foundation with supplemental funding from the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program and then later from the Audubon Society of Southwest Florida. The concept of ecosystem services is documented way back in the beginning of Western culture. Plato discussed the value that the olive trees uh, provided in the cliffs and um, foothills around Athens in terms of prote protecting from flooding and stabilizing the soil and also in providing the watershed from which the city drew its drinking water. Environmental services were first um, identified and uh, defined in 1970 in a study of critical environmental problems in MIT. And this listed services including the insect pollination through crops, uh, fisheries, climate regulation, and flood control. In the ecosystem services term was first used in the scientific literature by Ehrlich and Ehrlich in their book, Extinction, the Causes and Consequences. And they discussed how the loss of these species will result in the loss of the ecosystem services that they provide, and it will have very negative um, impacts upon the economy. Modern expansions of ecosystem services also include socioeconomic and conservation objectives, um, be besides the just dollar values that you can estimate from ecosystem services. The United Nations uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment identified four major categories of ecosystem services. Provisioning, such as production of the food and water that we utilize. Regulating, including the control of climate and disease. Supporting, such as nutrient cycles and the crop pollination. And the cultural benefits that we get from spiritual and recreational. You know, for example, some cultures look towards certain landscape features as a very important spiritual aspect. Mount Fuji in Japan has an economic benefit to the Japanese economy over over and above just the idea that it's a, a place that people can build real estate upon. Um, we've had our first work on ecosystem services done for the National Estuary Program area, which includes Sarasota, Charlotte, and Lee Counties, in 1998 by Hazen and Sawyer, and this is done in 1995 dollars. They only looked at two aspects of ecosystem services, consumer surplus, which is considered the money that people will pay over and above what the actual cost of a thing is because they value that. How much more money people will pay to come to Charlotte Harbor to fish than they would say to fish in New Jersey. Um, and so the, su the consumer surplus in 1995 dollars came out to about 1.8 billion for the whole Charlotte Harbor system. They also looked at total and direct and indirect income for those things they could get measures from, like fishery landings for commercial fisheries, income from different resource extractions, and this came out to about $3.2 billion within the CHNEP study area. When you adjusted, this is the breakdown by table from tourism, recreation industry, commercial fishing, recreational fishing, the other recreational activities, agriculture, they also included the phosphate mining in this, and the non-use value of wetland areas where people will go out and bird watch, for example. Non-use means you don't extract the resource, you don't damage the resource in order to get the economic value. And when you did it in 1995 dollars, it was a total of five billion, adjusted for inflation, about 7.59 billion in 2012 dollars. The thing about this study, though, is this is not total ecosystem services value. It's just two aspects of ecosystem services. Um, now, 80% of our commercial and recreationally harvested marine fish species depend on mangrove estuaries for at least a portion of my life cycle. And one of my very first um, activities when I began working for the state coming out of college was I was involved with a federal lawsuit uh, for one of the first DRIs proposed in our area here in southwest Florida called the estuaries. And down there, they wanted to take the area of the north side of Estero Bay and basically turn it into a city that looked just like Cape Coral, with all the finger canals removing all the mangroves and the spreader systems and things like that. And um, one of the things that had happened was that during the course of the development review, the developers went ahead and started cutting the mangroves even without permits. And this led to a federal enforcement action um, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Army Corps of Engineers. 
And when it went to federal court, the judge said the only damages he would allow, financial damages he would allow for the cutting of the mangroves was what was um, found in terms of the commercial fishery value because there was a federal interest in commercial fishery that could be linked to a federal uh, court case. So I was tasked with calculating what was the ecosystem service value of the commercial fishery for that red mangrove forest in Estero Bay. And it came out um, that for a six meter tall canopy of red mangroves of about 20 feet tall, it was $2,040.54 per year each generated each year for the commercial fishery in this area. Um, this translated into about $12,000 in 2012 dollars, or about $776 million per year comes to the economy from the mangroves and the commercial fishery in that Estero Bay area. Now, later on, when I worked at the aquatic preserves, I did some studies on the differences between natural mangroves left alone and mangroves which have been cut into hedges. And I did this in seven different aquatic preserves. And I was able to measure how much contribution they made to the commercial fisheries. And it turns out to be very different than a lot of people would like to claim. The hedgers want to say it was a benefit, but in fact, hedging a mangrove does more damage than just a linear loss of that height. It's a nonlinear effect. So a five-foot-high hedge only contributes about $143 per acre per year, whereas a 35-foot-tall canopy left in its natural condition, that's about the peak height that our mangroves will get around Charlotte Harbor, gives you $6,514. So when you put that in the $2012, about $618 for the hedge versus $28,000 for a mangrove left alone. And this is a pairwise comparison right on um, Captiva Island. Um, this, these were the original mangrove, this is the height of the original mangrove forest. This is what he hedged it down to and actually quite a few mangroves died in this system. And the house was actually built in a mangrove forest too. This is also ended up being an enforcement case, but um, just shows you how different the landscape becomes and how different the ecosystem services provided by that shoreline. Now, all these values I've talked about are commercial, and recreational fisheries values can be 5.6 to 6.5 times greater than the primary sales of commercial fisheries. So that gives you about 146,000 to 169,000 per acre per year of mangroves in the Charlotte Harbor ecosystem. And then down here you can see um, Tim, who talked about Lake Okeechobee in one of his proud days fishing the estuary. Um, so, nor does this include all the erosion protection value, the tourist income, the bird watching, canoeing, recreational non-fishing boating, water quality enhancement, privacy screening, habitat values, all these other ecosystem services values which come from the mangrove system. Or the carbon credits and carbon sequestration. It turns out that mangroves and salt marsh will store up to 50 times more carbon in their soils by area than tropical forests and 10 times more than temperate forests. So if you're looking for a carbon zinc, a mangrove forest is the place to go. Um, so depending on how you calculate and what the relative value is of the carbon credits, it could be um, about $12 in 2013 um, based on the policy changes of the USA and the European Union. So peak mangrove carbon fixation is about 16 tons per acre per year for mangroves in a brackish water 15 parts per thousand condition. And our southern slash pine forest, which is our most common upland forest system, is about 14 tons per acre per year if you let the stand grow up to 50 years old. Now, that's not commonly done here. Right now they can chop them down at 20 to 30 years of age. But if you just grow it for the carbon, you can get, get that much treatment. So for the CHNEP, just these two habitats could provide 3 million tons of carbon fixation per year and help us with the global warming problem. And then if you do all the calculations out, that could come out to about $1.4 billion per year just from the mangroves that we could be selling as carbon credits to places like China and India and Europe. Now, another way to look at ecosystem services, and I had the help here of the Lee County Tourist Development Bureau and Tamara Pigott with this, is what people will spend to be on a beach in southwest Florida in the CHNEP area. And it turns out that with the 72 linear miles of beach in, in our study area, you get about $10.84 million paid by people per mile to be on the beach in southwest Florida. 
That's pretty good generation of, of income. Calculated to about um, $2012 is about a billion dollars per year is brought to our economy by people who are, for example, in East Germany who have saved up their life savings so they can get on an airplane to come to the airport to go to the beach on Sanibel or Captiva or Fort Myers Beach or Naples or any of our regional area. And we are a destination about the beach. More than half, and depending on which local government you're talking about, it's anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of all tourism to our area. They spend at least one day at the beach, along with the other activities they're doing. And most of the people down here rate it going to the beach here as more important than going to Disney World. Um, Mangrove forest total economic value, if you look at the treating all mangroves as being mature, and this is a, a problem that I would like to address in the future with a better study of the different types of mangrove forests, but treating them all as mature um, for the full CHNEP study area, which I've colored here are the mangroves in green, $49.2 billion are contributed um, per year. For our seagrass beds, about $6.1 billion per year. I'll let you know, this is not something you just go to a computer and ask them. You, I, I spent a lot of steps to go through the 38 ecosystem services values and do all the total, and you get it from the local figures. I want to point out, too, that these values are unique to our area. So if you did the calculation in a place where there were no people, it would be a lower ecosystem service value. Salt marsh, which we have less of, only about 14,000 acres, still $77.25 million per year contributed. So now, in a particular project that I was funded for by the Elizabeth Ford Way Dunn Foundation with a pass through the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, plus supplements funding from the CHNEP, I was able to look at a, one particular study area. And that was enough, enough funding to do the project for basically Pine Island Sound. Sanibel Island, Captiva Island, North Captiva Island, Kea Costa, Yusefa, and all the other islands within the system. And out into the Gulf of Mexico to about the area where a lot of the shells that come up on the beaches have their natural habitat. And when they die, they wash up on the beaches. And then Pine Island up to its tidal extents as far as the tidal water goes. So I picked up the mangrove fringe on the east side of Pine Island Sound. And working with uh, Tim Walker, um, I compiled the best, most recent maps from a number of sources. Here are the um, National Oceanographic and Aeronautic Administration uh, topo subsurface topography or bathymetry of the harbor system. And then the benthic habitat mapping had been done by Mo Marine Lab of the benthic habitats in this area, and they had confined that to the interior bay systems. The seagrass mapping that had been done by the South Florida Water Magic District, and this is the most recent, and broken into continuous and discontinuous. The um, land use map that came from the South Florida Water Magic District and uh, breaking that down into many s small categories of, and different types of residential as well as natural habitat systems. And this is an example of all those different categories which came off of the land use map from the Water Magic District. And then the salt marsh mapping that I had done in that three-year study that I've told the council about before, and which is much more specific, more accurate salt marshes to all the different types which occur in southwest Florida, much more specific than the water management district's mapping of salt marshes. And we combined all of these into an overlayer to provide the first combined um, below-surface and above-surface land cover map for a watershed within uh, southwest Florida. Normally when you get maps, you'll see the land cover map, you'll see the seagrass map, you'll see um, the map of the subsurface bathymetries. You don't have them all put together into one map. And the reason I did this is with the total ecosystem services values that I had calculated for each habitat type, I could then, using GIS, overlay a topography of landscape value for the whole study area. So basically, you have the dollar values per acre overlaid on the habitats, all contiguous, and it smooths it out whether it's above the surface or below the surface. And what you'll see is the highest value lands are those beaches. And it's basically a thin red line 
that runs all along the beach edge. And then behind that, you'll find the orange or dar darker orange colors will be the mangroves, the seagrass beds, and other natural habitats which provide a lot of production. Even the um, man-made habitats which had land cover on them were credited for some ecosystem services value. And because Sanibel has some unique land codes in which in the newer development areas on the western part of the island, they are to retain the natural habitat. So the ha houses are built inside of areas of tropical hardwood hammock, with marshes around them, with mangroves around them. They could even credit those yards, those individual residential areas, as having a higher ecosystem service value than, say, a yard that was just a lawn with queen palms than in some places on the east end of the island where they have yards that are just gravel and they don't have any vegetation in them at ever. And I could, with the information I got from the city of Sanibel, I was able to parse that out and give different ecosystem service values and different credits in different parts of the uh, study area. So I got the total value here for the 2012 period. And then we applied the future land use maps, the projected land use map based upon the comprehensive plan for the areas here in the city of Sanibel and the Lee County parcels, and moved that out into the 2030 landscape. So this showed the ecosystem services values as we would further develop the property. And it, it does go down within the total study area. And then we applied one foot of sea level rise into that future landscape. So we could see where the sea level would change the habitats which would occur in this study area into the future. And depending on um, which projection you use, and this is in the paper that um, we have posted online, this could be anywhere from 2065 to somewhere around 2300, depending on the rate of sea level rise and which model you're considering. But um, what we do have here is in blue where the sea level would be, and then here the recalculation where we show the 20 to 30 future with one foot of sea level rise and get the ecosystem services value across that total landscape. So this EcoServe tool that I developed allows you to project what happens to ecosystem services. This tool could be used in a lot of other contexts too. You could take a landscape and put in a future development plan. And, you know, with their, what they're going to build, what they're going to preserve, how they're going to change it, and can show how the ecosystem services would change in that particular project area. Or with a larger unified plan, say for the density reduction groundwater recharge zone in Lee County, or an overlay region that might be in the big Cypress Basin in Collier County. And we could, we could project these um, changes in what would be, we gain and what we would lose in terms of ecosystem services value, and then you could do other economic evaluations of what you'd expect your economic return would be and do a, a cost-benefit analysis of what that land use change would provide for you. Now, it's important that we don't just treat, well, you know, beaches have the higher value, mangroves a second, so we're just going to preserve beaches and mangroves and let the rest go. Because the values come from interconnectedness, and, you know, southwest Florida really depends upon all the a patchwork quilt of habitats drawn together by that thread of water. And particularly services like potable drinking water need a whole range of habitats to provide the aquifers from which we may draw our water or the surface waters to be cleaned. And quite frankly, what we're talking about here today about Lake Okeechobee is a prime example of what happens when you partition and cut habitats apart and try to put barriers and dikes around habitats instead of letting them interconnect. Um, just for some summary information to give you an idea of the acres of habitat in the study, the most common um, habitat within the study area were the embayments, the uh, water systems. Um, in t little log scale, so I can make the lettering a little clearer, but you can see it's, it's embayments, then the Gulf of Mexico areas, and then eventually we get into areas that are mangrove and the unvegetated um, tidal flats terms of area. In terms of dollar value, it was a swimming beach that had the highest per acre dollar value, um, followed by the continuous seagrass, oyster bars, freshwater marshes. I did cypress calculations in this study, even though they didn't show up on the map. I was able to use them later when I was um, funded um, by the um, Audubon Society to calculate the ecosystem services value of the conservation lands that Lee County had purchased in their conservation 2020. 
And then um, I also did de- more detailed salt marsh work with those 12 different salt marsh types. And it really makes a difference. If you do the typing by the salt marsh, you get a more accurate and a higher ecosystem service value. So it's notable that the majority of the total ecosystem services value were in the top seven habitats. Mangrove swamp, continuous seagrass beds, estuarine embayments, swimming beaches, the near shore Gulf of Mexico, discontinuous seagrass beds, and unvegetated shallow subtidal bottoms. Now that one, last one's particularly significant because that's often an area that no one's providing any particular protection to. They say, well, no seagrass is there, it's a shallow bottom, we're just going to let people do what they want in it. In fact, it provides a lot of ecosystem services value in commercial and recreational fisheries. So these seven habitats make up about 83.87% of the physical area of the study area. Also, what I did in this study, which no one has done before in an ecosystem services study, is not treat what you have changed by the sea level rise as just being lost, but also showing the gain you get in shallow water habitat. Because when you change an upland into a shallow water, that shallow water still has an ecosystem services value. It's not zero. And the other published studies people have done before, they just zero out the value once the sea level has risen over the habitat. And that's not the case. So you need to take a look at a net. So it makes a difference. But what's interesting in, in terms of all of this, when we look at the final table, um, when you uh, consider the total ecosystem services value just for that small study area, one watershed in southwest Florida, it's about $7 billion in 2012 values. Um, when you go to the future land use and make the changes and develop out a lot of the native habitats, it, goes, it drops down to $5 billion. And if you add the sea level rise, it'll take it down to about 4 so you actually get more ecosystem services value loss by developing land than you do from the climate change sea level rise in terms of a proportionate loss. About 26% loss from the changing the landscape of development, um, 16% loss from sea level rise alone. So this tool can be used in a lot of other ways, and I'd like to do that in the future. Um, like I said, we've been able to assist um, in evaluating the conservation land values for Lee County, we could do it for other conservation land values and other local government areas. Um, we could do it for a whole region. I do have uh, two different grant applications in, one with the Gulf of Mexico program and another one, um, let's see, who was that with? That was with um, the Patagonia, no, not Patagonia, um, NOAA, NOAA, um, to um, do this for the whole Southwest Florida region. And I've got... Um, calculations not just for these coastal habitats, but also cypress, wet prairies, agricultural lands in places like Glades and Hendry County. So I'll be able to do the whole region together. And so that's kind of what I did on my summer vacation, uh, (laughs) along with um, some other activities. And um, so we're going to keep working on this, and um, I hope Tim and I will have the opportunity to, to expand and utilize it. It's not a doesn't cost a lot to do. We were able to do um, that watershed for about forty thousand dollars. We were able to do the calculations for the conservation lands for about five thousand dollars. Any questions? When's Collier? Collier's when we have the funding. Can you apply for grants for it? Well, we have. Like I said, I've, uh, the Gulf of Mexico program and also um, to a se- separate of application to NOAA. And the Gulf of Mexico would be coming from the BP money when that comes through. And we're actually proposing to do it not just for southwest Florida, but the whole Gulf Coast. So I'll um, be doing it for all of Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Mexico. I'll brush up on the Spanish. And Jim, you're essentially synthesizing your existing documentation. You're not doing an awful lot of research going up in the swamp. And I'm not going into the swamp and measuring myself, but I'm gathering information from specific sources from our region. Okay. So it's, it's, it's not a situation um, where we're using data from the Pacific Northwest or, or Europe or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And this can be updated through time. You, we could plug this into spreadsheets so that if the tourism increases, it may increase the ecosystem service value, or if it went down, yeah. it would too. How do you prioritize which uh, 
land uses uh, have more value? And, and where do you get the value from, the actual dollar? Well, we've got 38 ecosystem services that habitats can provide. So for each of those habitats, I gather the data on what they do and what they don't. First, I do a check mark. I say, does it do that service? Does it not do that service? So like storm surge protection, yes, mangroves will do that. Um, Gulf of Mexico, submerged bottom, no, it does not. And so then you looked at particular studies that were done for this area where they looked at the dollar value in terms of insurance reduction for a property that has the mangroves in front of it. And that's where that dollar value came for, for that example. In terms of the oxygen production, I look at the um, oxygen production measures that have been for each of those habitat types, what seagrass does, what mangrove does, what a f um, pine forest does. Um, for the tourist values, I got that from the Individual Tourist Development Bureau. In this case, I only needed to use Lee. But in, if we went to a wider area, we'd use their other specific ones. Uh, fisheries landings were specific fish by species that were dependent upon that habitat. So I have a total list of all the fishery landing by species, the dollar values for that. I take out the fish that aren't specific to mangroves, that aren't specific you know, to salt marsh, and then I total those values for that, then divide them by the project area. If I get a chance to map more de detailed, um, like I said, if I could do the mangrove forest types, I could even drill down tighter on this. But right now I'm having to use average figures for habitats when I don't have the more detailed like I do for the salt marsh. Yeah. And you are even placing values on just open water. Right. Dependent upon depth, too, right? Right. And, that, and, that's, and the, the depth relates to the fishery and the shelling and the shell production value. So, you know, shelling is a big, big economic engine uh, for Sanibel and Captiva. So they, they came into the figures very effectively there. Um, up in Venice, it would be shark's teeth. Sure. I mean, I can see, you know, the guys, they, you know, five, six feet of water for target fish. I mean, mm -hmm. that's very because That's why the shallow, unvegetated bottoms came into play. Tarpon fish and bone fish and redfish, uh, flounder all the different specialized fishery. Pompano off of the beach is a high value of fish for low poundage. And I didn't you know, count what they get in the fisheries landing when they go out and catch the tuna or the mahi. That doesn't come into the calculation at all. But when we do the total Gulf of Mexico study, then we'll, we'll, we'll figure into that too. Hey, Jim. Yes. Uh, did you look at any riverine or you know river along river beds and uh, well specifically because I've got a DRGR thing coming up in Benita um, the value of resources in rivers? We didn't have any rivers in this particular study area, but I did look at riverine forest in the Conservation 2020 study. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, basically there, there are different um, functions that are provided in terms of buffering, repairing an edge, um, relating to fresh water. So if you want to see the specifics on that, I've got the um, study posted um, on the Estero Bay Agency on Bay Management webpage on the, um, for the Regional Planning Council. And so you can download the um, PDF file that has the whole 18-page um, report in it. Yeah, I've read that. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to be able to ask you to make a presentation to my city council and maybe refer to that report. Would you be able to, to make some of that information a, you know, part of your presentation? Well, I can tell them about what I've done so far, but say doing a study of the um, Benita um, Springs DRGR, it would take me some time to calculate the ecosystem services value there. And I'd need some funding, and I'd need some funding to do that. Yeah. Okay. We can still make a presentation on this to get them to think. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be happy to do this presentation for them, or if you thought a more abbreviated version would, would be helpful, you know, during a council session, do something like that. Yeah, because um, we usually give 10 minutes for a presentation. Yeah. So, you know, you... Um, but I think talking about the strength is really important about how, you know, 
you've got an animal over here or a, a, a plant species over there and how uh, maybe the animal mostly lives or the plant mostly lives in a certain ecosystem but occasionally has to jump over during a certain season to another ecosystem so while they're predominantly in one place all of those ecosystems tied together uh, you know provide their habitat and you can't just say well we're going to mitigate for the wetland over here and you know maybe occasionally the animal needs to use the wetland during dry periods where it's shallow or you know uh, I think that strain is really important to emphasize. And I can do that and I can point out to them how the health of their beaches begins in the DRGR. Oh God, yes, I'm going to set you up for a presentation. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to do. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to listen to what I have to say. Thank you. You're welcome. Great What's that? That's a great mass. Uh-huh. I showed your fish, too. Oh, yeah. Who, who's this team walking to? I know. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. This is really nice. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you.